The question starts like this, Shalom. I understand that there are so many interpretations to the verse that's found in 1 Corinthians 15.29. So I would like to know your opinion concerning it. The verse reads, and it's on the slide, Otherwise, what will they do who are baptized for the dead, if the dead do not rise at all? Why then are they baptized for the dead? This indeed is a very good question, and it is, I want to tell you, it is considered by many as one of the most difficult to interpret in the scriptures. As a, as a result, uh, one can count some 200 different interpretation given for this passage alone. But I would like to share one interpretation that takes in consideration the context of the Bible, of history, and of the original language, that is the Greek. It is true that Paul... Paul does not always make things easy for us to understand. For even in his own time, Peter says concerning Paul's writing that all his epistles, all his letters, speaking in them of these things in, in which are some things hard to understand, which untaught and unstable people twist to their own destruction, as they do also the rest of the scriptures. Second Peter 3.16, Paul wrote like the rabbis of his time. At times, it, it is a language in itself. And notice one thing that Peter says here, which is very nice. Uh, at the end of the verse, he puts Paul's writing at the same level as the rest of the scriptures, right? So, and so were Peter's own words, because we know that all scriptures from Genesis to Revelation is inspired by God. However, considering 1 Corinthians 15, 29, it is on this type of difficult verse, verse that is that cults strive. But in this case, I think the problem is mainly with the translators rather than our understanding of what Paul wrote. Let us remember one thing to begin, that in the original languages of the Bible, Hebrew and Greek, there were no punctuations, that is, no commas or, or points, which signifies when a sentence ends and another begins. Nor were there any pauses to a, or indication when a new subject was being dealt with. Furthermore, there were no chapter divisions in, in, in the original text, okay, nor there were titles. Never would you hear Paul or, or John say, you go to uh, Habakkuk chapter, chapter 3 verse 1 or so on and so forth because they were not put there. The punctuations were placed much later on around the 6th or 7th century. Now this being said, many of these passages should be understood according to the subject at hand and by its context, not only biblical context, historical context. And the section of 1 Corinthians 15 we are dealing with is a very important subject. This is the chapter of the resurrection, okay, the resurrection itself. This, the resurrection is at the core of our belief. For if there is no resurrection, we're completely lost. Completely lost. It is first of all the resurrection of Yeshua that differentiates us from all other religions. We know where the tombs of the, the, the leaders of those major religions are. Okay? They are with us today. But in contrast, Yeshua's tomb was empty. Why? Because he resurrected. This is what makes the Bible distinct. The belief in the resurrection is at the core of one's salvation. Paul said in Romans 10, 9, if you, that if you confess with your mouth the Lord, Yeshua, and believe in your heart, what? That God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. If you believe that God raised him from the dead, that is, if you believe in the resurrection of Jesus, if you believe that he's now alive, you will be saved. When I pray, I pray to a living God and a living Messiah. It, it, it's interesting how, how people might argue that the resurrection is something that we learn only with time and that we don't need to believe right away. Well, consider for a moment the thief on the cross. Yeshua said to him, today you will see me in paradise. The, the thief was called to believe in the resurrection even in those very few moments they had together. He believed the words of Yeshua and you know what? Right now he's there with him. However, the problem is that already in the first century and only about 20 years after Jesus resurrected, that some came into the congregations of believers and you know what? They began to deny the resurrection. Imagine. They were very fast. That got Paul to, to remove his gentle white gloves and put on his boxing ones instead. And you don't want to fight against Paul. 
right? He was short. He wasn't a good speaker, uh, as we learn in Second Corinthians, but his punches are very powerful. He wrote to this congregation, and he said in verse 12 of chapter 15 of, of 1 Corinthians, Now if, if Christ is preached that, that he has been raised from the dead, how do some among, among you say that there is no resurrection of the dead? How could it be? He could not understand how low they stooped down. And here is, he is not shy, by the way, to scold them. And then he adds in verse 16, 17, 18, For if the dead do not rise, then Christ is not risen. And if Christ is not risen, your faith is futile. You are still in your sins. Then also those who have fallen asleep, that is those who died, the believers who died in the Messiah, they perish completely then. And then in a conclusion of his argument, which goes on for a few more verses, he says in verse 29, and our translation says, and this is our verse, by the way, today. Otherwise, what will they do who are baptized for the dead? If the dead do not rise at all, why then are they baptized for the dead? This is, I believe, from the New King James Version. By being translated this way, Okay, it throws off the whole argument and teaching about baptism and resurrection, and this is why it became so complicated. It is as if Paul taught baptism for the dead, okay, something he never did. And besides which, baptism does not save. Why would you want to baptize somebody for, uh, who, who died? And before we look at the original text, what does baptism symbolize? Okay, it is linked with the resurrection, okay? What does baptism symbolize? Does it symbolize death or this symbolizes life? Let's read Colossians chapter 2, verse 12, which clarifies the symbolic action of baptism. It is a statement of faith that we make that we too follow Yeshua into death, burial, and resurrection. Right? It says, Buried with him, with Yeshua in baptism, in which you also were raised with him through faith in the working of God who raised him from the dead. From the dead. Following Paul's argument, he's asking one question. What about do those who are baptized? Okay, Are they baptized for the dead? Or are they baptized unto life and living hope? The answer is very easy. They're baptized unto life and living hope. No believer is baptized to death and no dead need to be baptized. This is a strange doctrine which has no biblical foundation. So how are we going to read this verse? Let us read it uh, by being more faithful, okay, not only to the context of the whole Bible, but also of the chapter and also toward the way it is written in the original text text, right? By putting the punctuation and leaving the original words in their spot. This is what it gives. You have it in the screen. Otherwise, what of those who are baptized? Are they baptized for the dead? If the dead are not raised at all, why are they baptized? For the dead? The answer is absolutely no. For we are baptized unto eternal life. That is the symbol of baptism. And those who deny the resurrection are destroying the very doctrine of baptism itself. You know, Paul would never preach a baptism for the dead. This, again, will go against the very fiber of the scriptures. And this is why those who do that and preach this need to move away from the scriptures and add another book into their belief. Something they did, actually, and, and something that is forbidden in the scriptures. This, then, is one answer, which I pray will open more doors, more doors. And I'm convinced that, that there is much more to it if one goes and seeks the meaning of each word in this verse. Amen.